This is something different. Back in 1990, General Motors released their first front-wheel drive minivans to capture some of the huge minivan market that had been dominated by Chrysler and Ford. The result was a car that looked like nothing GM had ever sold before or since. Quickly dubbed the Dustbuster vans, since they looked like, well, a 1980s Dustbuster vacuum cleaner, their bizarre look and poor sales forced a complete redesign only six years later. This is the story of the Chevy Lumina APV, the Pontiac Transport, and the Oldsmobile Silhouette, the original GM Dustbuster vans. This is my old car. When it comes to new ideas for the family, nobody's running out. Right. I admittedly haven't gotten a lot of requests to do an episode on these specific minivans, although a few of you guessed it when I suggested on my community page that I would have a minivan episode coming up soon. I picked the Dustbuster vans as my first minivan episode because they were so bizarre and I've always liked weird cars, so I've been wanting to do this episode regardless of how many people have asked for it. Any other minivans from that era are still being considered for future episodes. And yes, that includes the Dodge Caravan, which I skipped in my earlier episodes back when I first started my channel reviewing old cars that I actually own. And speaking of the Caravan, I'm sure anyone watching this episode already knows that when it first hit the streets in 1984, the public response was huge, and it soon became what is arguably Chrysler's most famous car. Dodge Caravan, one vehicle that takes the place of an economy car, sporty car, station wagon, and van. General Motors needed its own minivan, and fast, which resulted in the 1985 Chevrolet Astro, Chevy, Chevy, Astro, Astro. and its twin, the GMC Safari. But GM decided to not replicate the front-wheel drive car platform like the Caravan. Instead, the Astro and Safari, which, although they were unibody, were built on a platform similar to GM's full-size vans, and borrowed several parts from the Chevy S10 pickup. The end result was a van almost the same length as the short wheelbase caravan, but nearly 10 inches taller. This, along with a truck-like frame and rear-wheel drive, meant it was only attracting buyers who basically wanted a tall truck, and not a more car-like tall wagon, as Chrysler's minivans were. Ford's response to Chrysler's minivans was the 1986 Aerostar, and although it was similar to GM's by being rear-wheel drive, it had a more car-like ride, held by coil springs in the rear instead of a truck-like leaf spring making it a decent alternative to Chrysler's minivans. Aerostar proves its versatility. Toyota also had their own minivan back then, but it didn't have a name, only known as the Toyota Passenger Wagon, or simply the Toyota Van. In some ways, it had a similar look to what GM would eventually create, but sales were much less than Chrysler or Ford. So much so that I suspect GM didn't consider Toyota much of a competitor in the minivan arena. <laughs> Toyota replaced their nameless van with the Previa by 1990, which was just about as weird, enough so that it definitely could have a future My Old Car episode. To set themselves apart from Ford and Chrysler, GM enlisted their Pontiac division to introduce a concept of a radical new minivan design. Using the platform of a Pontiac 6000 as a starting point, the concept van took the futuristic bubble look to new extremes, with lots of flush mounted glass that made it almost resemble a helicopter cockpit. And instead of the requisite sliding rear doors, the transport concept had huge gull wing doors, and even had a built-in Nintendo game console in the rear, neither of which, of course, would ever see production. Like most concept cars, it was far too bizarre to bring to market as is. Yet to the public's surprise, the production version was, well, still bizarre. GM execs probably didn't expect it back then, but the new minivans were quickly dubbed the Dustbuster vans. Cleans up little messes, one, two, three. Thanks to a shape that looked nearly identical to the then revolutionary handheld vacuum. And that name definitely wasn't intended as a compliment. GM's new minivan was built in a plant that was first built in 1896, and Chevrolet took ownership in 1914, before Chevrolet was even part of General Motors. The plant was in North Terrytown, New York, a place I remember because my dad, a former GM plant engineer, was transferred there in 1987 to help retool the plant for the new minivans. Sadly, they would be the last cars ever built there, as the plant shut down soon after the minivans ended production in 1996, exactly 100 years after the plant first opened. The plant was torn down in 1999, which led the residents voting to rename the town to Sleepy Hollow, hoping to attract people back to the town, since the name Terrytown was so closely linked to the GM plant that was now gone. Upon its release, GM was quick to point out that these new minivans weren't just space-age looking. They also had what was considered, at the time, a space-age frame design. Just like they had done with the Pontiac Fiero, and would soon release with their entire Saturn line, the body panels on the new minivans were a composite plastic attached to a galvanized steel space frame. 
although the front windshield design was similar to the Pontiac concept. In production form, it required three panes of glass, one huge one in front of the driver, and two smaller triangular pieces on the sides. This in effect created a second set of A-pillars, and probably the largest distance between the dashboard and windshield of any passenger car, before or since. The rear was equally unconventional, with the tail lamps residing within the D-pillars. In fact, these tail lamps were already so much higher than a typical car that for the first few years, a center-high mounted stoplight, or the Chimsel, wasn't even required. Initially, all these minivans would share a 3.1 liter V6 engine, mated to a three-speed automatic, making only 120 horsepower. Or at least that's all that was offered to US buyers. The same minivans were also offered for sale in Europe, but there could be had with a more economical quad four engine, and even a five-speed manual transmission. The GM vans offered three individual seats in the second row, and two individual seats in the third row, each of which could be removed, as opposed to the typical Chrysler and Ford option of offering bench seats. Of course, what would be no surprise to anyone, badge engineering was a foregone conclusion for any new GM vehicle back then. And of course, the branding differed in Europe as opposed to the US. More on that later. The new Chevrolet van wouldn't get its own unique name. It's an APV. An AP who? But instead share a name that they had already had on a four-door sedan introduced the previous year, the Chevy Lumina, another car which I hope to eventually have its own My Old Car episode. The minivan would get the letters APV added after the word Lumina on the badging, but to anyone looking at the two cars side by side, they likely question why Chevrolet would use the same name on what appear to be two entirely different vehicles. At least I know I did back then. But I have since learned that it was likely due to the fact that no wagon option was offered for the Lumina, unlike its predecessor, the Celebrity. So the Lumina APV became, in effect, the replacement for the Celebrity wagon. The Lumina APV, as with most Chevrolets, was intended to serve as a volume leader and compete directly with the base versions of the extended wheelpace Dodge Caravan and Plymouth Voyager as they were a close match in size and options. And like the caravan, the APV could be optioned as a cargo van, with a flat cargo floor and the second and third rows of seats removed. The Pontiac version of GM's new minivan maintained the same name as the original concept, the Transport. Transport, the Pontiac of minivans. I get so. Which was often misspelled since Pontiac decided to play on the name to emphasize this van would attempt to have, like all Pontiacs, a more sporty nature. The key word here is attempt since it still had the same anemic 120 horsepower engine. To make it appear sporty was a Pontiac prerequisite, lots of body cladding, with a look similar to the first generation Pontiac Grand Am, with its wraparound bumper. It also shared an unconventional dashboard design that was similar to other Pontiacs, most notably the wiper controls being large buttons attached to the dashboard cowl, as opposed to the more typical steering column stock. The final Dustbuster van went to Oldsmobile as a silhouette, which was to be GM's luxury minivan option. Hey Chili, is this your ride? Yeah, yeah, I'd like to sit up high, check everything out. I mean, it is the Cadillac of minivans. Competing directly with the Chrysler Town & Country and the Eddie Bauer version of the Ford Aerostar. On the outside, you could spot it easily with the black striped decals along the sides and back. And inside, it was the first GM minivan available with optional leather seats, although the Pontiac would later offer it on their GT model. Both the Pontiac and the Oldsmobile were also the first minivans to offer a power sliding door. Wow. You mind if I take it for a spin? Despite offering features not available in competitors' minivans, the GM minivan's bizarre look, not to mention the unusual driving experience with so much glass beyond the dashboard, turned off a lot of potential buyers, so sales couldn't compete with the best-selling Chrysler minivans or even the second-place Ford Aerostar. To help boost sales, engine options improved by 1992, with a 3.8-liter Buick-designed V6 making 170 horsepower, and an attempt to tone down the radical look. For 1994, a refresh was done to the exterior, reducing the front end by three inches, and the hood now at a slightly different angle than the windshield. Changes were also made to the dashboard to make the vast distance beyond the dashboard look a bit smaller, but it was still vast. And also by 1994, built-in child seats became optional. When GM offered the Dustbuster vans for export to Europe, a few changes were made to conform to European regulations, such as the amber turn signals and additional red running lights in the rear. European buyers initially didn't get a minivan under the Chevy brand, but they did get both the Pontiac and Oldsmobile. However, by the time the refresh was made in 1994 for those sold in America, sales had dropped low enough in Europe that GM decided on creating a hybrid version of the Pontiac and Oldsmobile. Specifically, European buyers got the silhouette body minus the black stripes and rebadged as a transport. Each of the attempts to help boost sales weren't helping by 1995, so replacements were in development for release in the 1997 model year with a more conventional windshield, 
rear tail lamps position lower, and, just like the updated Chrysler minivans in 1996, a sliding door on the driver's side. Pretty convenient, huh? Oh, Dad! Despite the Lumina sedan still being in production, Chevy dropped the Lumina name for the minivan, changing it to the Venture. The Pontiac and Oldsmobile names stayed unchanged, at least at first, with the Transport eventually gaining a Montana trim level, and later changing its name to just the Montana. And the silhouette lingered on until the death of the Oldsmobile brand in 2004. Europeans got the same minivan, but rebranded as the Opel and Vauxhall Sintra. And the Transport name continued in Europe, but it became the Chevrolet Transport. This wasn't the end of the GM minivans, however, with the final version of the U-Body beginning for the 2005 model year, with the Chevrolet getting yet another new name, this time called the Uplander, which, and this is just my opinion, was one of the strangest names for a car. So much so, that I wouldn't have wanted to buy it just because of the name. Pontiac kept the Montana name, and both Buick and Saturn joined the crowd, with the Terraza and the Relay. All four models had a similar body shape to the previous generation, except for a noticeably higher front hood. And it has the sporty good looks and attitude of an SUV. That hood was clearly meant to resemble an SUV, and few people fell for it. All four models were dead by 2009, and GM finally threw in the towel and gave up on minivans. Well, that last statement isn't entirely true. As of 2021, GM still produces a minivan for China, called the Buick GL8. It is actually on its third generation, with the first gen starting in 2000, looking a lot like a Chevy Venture, to the latest version, which is a completely new design with lots of luxury features, proving yet again why Buick remains in GM's lineup, because they love them in China. Compared to Ford, and especially to Chrysler, GM's attempt at minivans may be looked back today as a failure. <laughs> Yet because of their plastic body panels, some of the original Dustbuster vans have survived over 30 years later, since their bodies didn't rust away like so many other cars of the same age. And depending on who you ask, they were so weird, they've now become collector's items, as a little piece of history when GM decided to build a car so bizarre that its Dustbuster nickname maybe has become more famous than the little vacuum that inspired it. And if you're interested in dust, we have a quaint little piece from the 1980s. It's called a Dustbuster. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, click the like button and subscribe to my channel. If you once owned a car from the 80s to mid 2000s that you rarely see today and would like it featured in a future episode, leave a reply in the comments or contact me at the email shown here. See you next time. Uh oh, and a barrage of pretzels now knocking Whitey unconscious.